thank you that you have called out a people like us to sing of your praises. And I pray, God, that you would cause us to grasp the significance of singing praises to you. Thank you that we hear little voices in our, our, in our congregation singing praises to you, Lord. Mature those voices into lives that are devoted to you in all things. Because you're worthy. Help us now as we consider your word. In Christ's name, amen. Please turn in your copy of God's holy and perfect word to the gospel of Mark, chapter 1 and verse 35. Mark, chapter 1 and verse 35. If you don't have a Bible, you'll find one in the seat in front of you. That'll be on page 837. If you don't own a Bible, please take that Bible home to be yours to keep. Today, I'm doing something a little bit different. Well, not a little bit. A lot different than what you will typically get for a sermon at Abner Creek. Normally, it's during this time that I invite you to open up your Bibles to a certain section of Scripture and then I proceed to explain that portion of the Bible and seek to apply it to our lives today. But today, instead of having you turn to a specific passage that we'll stay in, you're in Mark 1 to begin with, but we're not going to stay there. Instead of staying in one specific passage, like we've been walking through John over the last year, I'm going to have you considering a particular topic and what the Bible has to say about it. The topic that I'm going to be considering today may surprise you a little bit because today I'm going to be preaching on preaching. If you're someone who's not a regular churchgoer, if you are not a Christian, if you're unsure about the things of the church, I would guess that some of the things we do in our worship services might seem odd to you at times. Perhaps preaching is one of them. Why does a man stand up and talk about a book that was written hundreds of years ago? Is it really that important? Is it really that good? Are there many venues where you can find something that looks a little bit like preaching? Or someone stands and they talk in front of a group of people? But while other exercises may share certain motions of preaching, I want to convey to you today why preaching is unique to all of them and so much more important. More important than a political speech, more important than a college lecture, more important than a comedy routine or a presentation at work or even the State of the Union address that you might hear. These other oratorical experiences share features with preaching, no doubt, but none of them come close to the reality and importance of what's taking place in the moment. I'm not just talking about my sermons as if uh, what I do is important. I'm talking about all genuine biblical preachers, what they do. Why is it important? I want to answer that for you today. Now, why would I commit an entire sermon to preaching on preaching. I mean, why not just open up to the next text in John that we've been studying and preach through those verses like we normally do? Well, the answer to why I'm committing one week to this is actually getting into the outline of this sermon. So I have three categories I want to consider regarding preaching today. Number one, why am I preaching on preaching? Devoting a whole sermon to it. Number two, what is preaching? And number three, how should you receive preaching? Why am I preaching on preaching? What is preaching? How should you receive preaching? The first question is that. Why am I devoting an entire sermon on preaching? And that's, in essence, I'm asking the question, why does this matter? Today? And why does it matter every week? The reality is, if, if I can't answer that, then I'm wasting both your time and mine. 
Is this what we do on Sunday morning? This, this exercise of someone speaking and someone listening and looking at a book. Uh, is it just routine? Is it just tradition? Is it just something people have done for years and years and years? Why is it important? I think it's important enough to consider it for a sermon. So two reasons why I'm preaching on preaching. Number one, because everything that's labeled preaching today is not preaching. And I want you to be able to discern the difference. To be able to be reminded of the difference. To be able to spot the difference. It amazes me the type of so-called preaching that you can find out there. And it's more accessible than ever before. More than any other time in church history is the time like we have now in the internet age that a preacher preaching some message can find himself before your eyes and ears. Now just think about it. For overwhelmingly the majority of church history, if you were to hear a preacher preaching a message, you would have to actively pick up your feet and go listen to him physically. But now, with the touch of your finger on the black box in your, wa- in your pocket, these phones, he's on your phone, on your social media feed, there is an entire TV channel devoted to preachers preaching. More than any other time in church history do we have now accessible to us those who would label themselves preaching, giving a message under the heading preaching on your phone, computer, social media, YouTube, downtown street corners, podcast. The preaching market is saturated with individuals who have something to say. But is the market saturated with true preaching? with so much of it available to us, might we be tempted to lower our standards just a wee bit for what true biblical preaching is? Preaching is one of the few vocations that for some reason people run to it without much thought given to the validity or credibility of the preacher. So I'll illustrate. If you're sick, Which one of you is ready to run to the man with his pop-up tent on the corner of the street with a sign that says, I'm a doctor, let me help you? Or if you have a toothache, who is ready to go to the motorhome dentist traveling around helping you, telling you to sit in his chair? (laughs) I'm not sitting in his chair. Which one of you who's ready to invest your money is ready to give it to the first person you find in a suit with a suitcase? Now these scenarios are silly to us because we know the importance of finding credibility in those offices before giving ourselves to them. But for many today, they walk into a room and if the environment feels good, if he makes me laugh, if he makes me cry, if I feel at home, well then there you go, there's my preacher. Hear the Apostle Paul's warning in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, which says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The Apostle Paul gives this wonderful image of people sitting under sound teaching and they just can't handle it. It's like little kids who can't sit still in their seat. Their ears start itching to something else they want to hear. And so then they go find it. And they put up teachers who will give them what they want to hear and that will suit their passions but will turn them away from listening to the truth. Charles Spurgeon once said it like this, quote, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Brothers and sisters, the time has come. 
The circus has come to town. You can find their tents set up all over the landscape. You can find plenty of preachers that will suit your own passions in telling you what you want to hear. You can find plenty of clowns, and dare we say, we have to say now, clownettes who will tell you what you want to hear, but will ultimately lead you away from the truth. Society is saturated with these so-called preachers, but not all of them are preaching. Many of them are. There are so many good preachers, but many of them are not. And I want you to be reminded, perhaps introduced to, and be able to discern the difference. I think it's important from time to time rather than just do the exercise of preaching to pause like today and spell out some of the particulars. That's the first reason why I'm preaching this message. Number two, the second reason I'm preaching on preaching is because I feel a particular burden to make sure that I pass the baton of biblical preaching on to future generations. And you might say, well, hold on a second. You are talking like you're 90 years old. You're still a young man yourself. Plenty of preaching left to do yourself. You're not old by any means. That's true until I'm compared with the kids of our church and the ones who will be born 10 years from now and 15 years from now. What preaching will they hear when they are your age? Who will be preaching if Abner Creek is around another 200 years? I suspect that I'll get the privilege of preaching many of your funerals, perhaps. But there will come a day when many of you will bury me. And the next preacher. And the next preacher. My point is, the baton must always be passed from one generation to the next. It can't stop with just one person or any one church. It must keep going. And listen, we can't assume that it will keep going. We must be proactive in passing it. The more kids that are born into our church, and there are many of them, by God's grace, the more I feel a burden to ensure that they know what true preaching is. Why? Because the natural way of life is leading them to a day when you won't be there for them, I won't be there for them, and what preaching will they give themselves to? Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.2, What you've heard from me and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So get the the line of progression. Paul teaches Timothy. Timothy teaches other men. Those other men teach other men. The baton must keep going. So just for a few minutes, if if you're a kid in the room, I want to talk to you particularly. So if you label, if you think, hey, I'm a kid. He's talking to me. All right, kids, this is for you, okay? You may not realize it, but every single week you come to your church with your parents, your grandparents, your aunt and uncle, whoever it may be. You come and you see me come up these steps or someone. You see me stand behind this pulpit and you hear me talk for a certain amount of time. Most of the time, too long, you think. (laughs) My kids ask me most of the time, Dad, how many pages of your sermon are going to be today? (laughs) But every week, kids, you see me or someone come stand here and you hear us talk. And you might not think much of it right now at all. Like, okay, he's up there talking. This is what he does every single week. This is what happens on Sunday. But listen, if you keep coming to church with your mom, dad, your aunt and uncle, your grandparents, if you keep coming, you will remember this time for the rest of your life. You may not remember any of my messages. My own kids may not remember any of my messages. But ingrained in you will be a pattern, a lifestyle of needing to come to church and hear God's word. And listen, as you get older, you will start to understand more the seriousness of this time. And then one day, kids, you still listening? 
one day your parents won't be there to take you to church. And I won't be here to preach a sermon. Maybe you'll be in another city. I don't know. And one day you'll have to make a decision. Am I going to go to church and hear somebody preach today? I mean, I get to make my own decision right now. Mom and dad's not here. I'm going to college. I'm starting my own job. I, I, am I going to go listen to someone preach? Is it worth my time? And you'll have to decide for yourself, will you go when your parents aren't making you? Will you listen? I want to talk to the boys in the room for a second. So if you're a young boy, lean in for a second. Listen. All right? Boys in the room, if you're not listening, I'm going to assume you're a girl. So you better listen. Just kidding. <laughs> Young boys, what if God, when you grow up, what if God would have you do what I do? What if he would have you do what Pastor Mark does or Pastor Will does? You may become a doctor, a businessman. Uh, what do you want to be? You may become an engineer, a builder, a plumber, a lawyer, a policeman. Young boys, what do you want to be when you grow up? What if God, all those things are wonderful jo jobs. What if God wants you to be a preacher? Have you ever thought about it? I often hear people say, I'm afraid to think about the world my grandchildren and great-grandchildren will grow up in. Listen, that world is coming. It's here in some degree. It will, it will need the next line of preachers to rally the troops to hold the line. Would any of our young Abner Creek boys be next in line? I'm serious. Young boys, I'm not going to tell you when to stop listening. I'm just going to keep talking to you the rest of the sermon. I'm serious. Challenging times lie ahead in the future. God will have his preachers for those challenging times. It is a marked down truth. God will preserve his church and he will preserve his truth that will be proclaimed through his preachers. Will any of our Abner Creek boys be any of them? Are we as a church ready to invest in men desiring preaching pastoral ministry to keep passing the baton? Churches die because they stop thinking about the future. Can we strategize about how to equip future preachers well? Who will be next? Who will be there to proclaim God's word? I feel a burden to pass it on because older men in the ministry, like our own Wallace Hughes, has passed it on to my generation. And they've passed it on because older men of their former generations have passed it on to them. It's our turn. Until the day that we die, it is our turn. So that's the first category I wanted to cover. Why am I preaching on preaching? I don't know if I convinced you if it's important or not, but I wanted to do it because I want to ensure that you keep thinking properly about preaching and to make sure we keep passing on the task. The second category concerning preaching that I want to think about with you is the question... What is preaching? And this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. What is preaching? If we are to decipher true preaching from false, then we need to know clearly what true preaching is. So I have four points to cover for you on the question, what is preaching? Number one, the Bible on preaching. Number two, the reality of preaching. Number three, the message of preaching. Number four, the effect of preaching. So let's begin with the Bible on preaching. This is the most important, is it not? I mean, who gives a rip about anything that I would say unless I'm able to show you in Scripture? That should be your mentality every Sunday that you come. I don't give a rip what he says unless it's coming from Scripture. What does the Bible have to say about preaching? And let me just tell you, <laughs> that is an elephant of a question 
an elephant, as they say in Lord of the Rings. It is an elephant of a question. What does the Bible have to say about preaching? My goodness, we could talk for hours. I'll only do three. But I'll just mention two. Just kidding. Just checking if you're listening. I'm just going to mention two passages. By the way, there's so much to say about preaching in general. I, I kid you not. I have never cut anything, I have never cut more out of a sermon than I did on this one. So, I'm trying to do it in one. Just two texts on preaching. Number one, Mark 135. This is where I had you turn. Mark 135. This is early on in Jesus' ministry when the disciples saw some of the miracles that Jesus had done, like casting out demons, he's healing people of sickness, and they wonder, why doesn't he just keep doing this? I mean, my goodness, these people are lining up in droves. They're, we don't have to go anywhere. They just show up, and he heals them, and this is wonderful. Why doesn't he just keep doing this? And then Mark, Jesus makes a direct point in Mark 1, verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. I mean, Jesus has people lining up to see him. He is meeting real felt needs. He's healing real hurting people. He's fixing societal problems. He's making a difference that you can see. And yet, he moves on because none of those things were his primary purpose. It's here. Here's a parenthesis sermon. It's here the church is helped by what our mission should be primarily. And mercy ministries and compassion ministries for the church have their place, but their place is not primary. Jesus moves on because he said he must preach elsewhere, for that is why he came. Jesus had a message from heaven, and that message would be delivered to the world primarily through his preaching. See, what the world needs most is not Jesus' miracles, but his message. They wanted his miracles, no doubt. But they needed his message more. The world today wants the amazing. You know, come on, dazzle us, preacher. And if you don't, we'll find one who will. That's one reason for church hopping. Individuals looking for the next trick. The world wanted his miracles. They needed his message. It's the same need for the world today. It brings me to the second passage on preaching. I'll have you turn here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I don't, I don't want to insult your intelligence. But if you find 1 Timothy, keep going one more. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here in this letter, Paul has been instructing a young pastor, Timothy, for, tr for three chapters. And at the end of chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy of the trustworthiness of the scriptures, this book. And he tells him that the word of God is God-breathed out. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's like Paul hands Timothy this book and says, Timothy, here are the scriptures and here are what they're profitable for. Now having the book full of these profitable things, what does Paul tell Timothy to do with it? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1. And as I read through these first beginning verses, I want you to listen and notice the escalating intensity in Paul's writing. 2 Timothy 4.1. Here we go. I charge you. Now that's a formal command. It's not a recommendation, Timothy. Timothy, this is a command. Formal. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. So here we are. God 
and Jesus are both witnesses of what Paul is commanding to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and to dead and the dead. Now, listen, this is where history is headed. Jesus comes back. He will judge the living and the dead. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who's to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing. In other words, I'm charging you with the knowledge in mind that Jesus will soon appear again. Don't sit around, Timothy. He's coming back. I'm charging you with this. I charge you by his appearing and by his kingdom. In other words, you are to receive this charge with full realization that the authority of the kingdom of God is behind it. Do you hear the mounting intensity? I charge you in light of all these things. We're like, yes, yes, yes. We hear, Paul. What are you charging with? Just say it. Dear Timothy, As you have God's perfect word, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing, that's soon coming, and by his kingdom with all its authority, Timothy, preach the word. That's what they need. When the end comes, and the appearing is seen, and the kingdom is full, they will be glad they heard it. And many will be regretting that they didn't listen. This was the primary mission of the church and Jesus. And notice, it's the primary mission he gives to the church. Proclaiming God's word. Preaching his message. Heralding his kingdom. Preparing the people. Preaching the word. Jesus did it and he gives the task to his church. That's just two passages on what the Bible says about preaching. Jesus did it and he's given the task to the church. The Bible on preaching. Number two, the reality of preaching. This is under point two that says, what is preaching? It's the Bible on preaching. Number two, the reality of preaching. What I'm getting at when I say the reality of preaching is this. What is the reality that's taking place in this moment? And by the way, pretty much everything else I have to say in the rest of this sermon I'm thinking our implications of that 2 Timothy 4 passage. So, if that passage would explode, I think some of these implications would be the fallout. What's the reality of what's taking place in this moment? So when a man stands up in front of a church, he opens this book and then he opens his mouth. What is fundamentally happening in that moment? Here's what's happening in summary form. If the man is speaking truth from Scripture that's breathed out by God, he is delivering a divine heavenly message from God. Please don't let those just be words. I pray every week that my heart would not allow those just to be words. When the preacher preaches in accordance with the Scriptures... He's not just speaking about the scriptures. He's delivering a divine message. Which means this medium matters. And so many other of our, of our mediums are getting shorter. You can go on TikTok and you have a certain amount of time to use it. You can go on Instagram and post a certain amount of time for a video. Everything's getting shorter. God would still speak to his gathered people when things are getting shorter and more and more people are staying home watching God would still speak to his gathered preacher through a pre- to his gathered people through a preacher yesterday marked 174 years ago that Charles Spurgeon was converted it was a wintry day snow all over the ground. Many people didn't go to church that day, but Spurgeon happened to fall upon, happened in the providence of God, to fall upon this snowy covered Methodist chapel. And he walks in and not many people are there. Not even the preacher could make it there that day. And there's this unknown preacher, unknown deacon, who was the preacher for the day. 
The deacon says, hey, nobody else is here to do it. I'll open God's word. The unknown deacon gets up, unplanned, opens to the book of Isaiah, preaches a stumbling, fumbling message, I'm sure, and Charles Spurgeon was converted. Through the message of heaven coming through a preacher to his people. Consider the weight of it. Fundamentally, in this time, it's not about a human man. It's not about him giving his opinion or telling his story or entertaining you. It's not even about primarily him educating you. There's education involved, but it's not fundamental in preaching. You might have wondered before, is there a difference in preaching and teaching? I hold that there is. There's certainly overlap between the two, but there's a clear difference as well. Thomas Schreiner explains the difference like this. In teaching, one is fundamentally explaining. In preaching, one is fundamentally exhorting. In other words, I like to think of it as teaching is more explanation while preaching is proclamation. Preaching certainly includes teaching. Teaching does not always include preaching. They're not pitted against each other, but there's a distinct difference. And it's a critical difference. Because in preaching, a preacher is not simply explaining a text. It must be included, of course, but it's not all the preacher's doing. Every week when I open God's Word and I explain a text, I hopefully am trying to do that. But I'm not trying to simply give you a verse-by-verse commentary explanation of what it means. You can go find a good book and read about that yourself. Instead, it's the preacher's job to take the text, unpack its meaning, and then to declare, to proclaim, to exhort you in light of this text, in light of what God is saying to you in this text, this is God's message to you right now. And the preacher is a messenger, not simply an explainer. There is a heavenly message from God to be delivered to his people today. So in that sense, preachers join the long line of prophets who have said for years, thus saith the Lord. The preacher is a herald who comes out of the palace on behalf of the king and proclaims to the community, hear ye, hear ye, on this day in 2024, the, t- the king has declared that in two weeks his presence will be made known, his favor and judgment will be dispersed. Prepare yourselves accordingly. It's the job of a herald. When he stands to preach, so far as he t- stays true to the text, he's not just explaining a verse, He's delivering a message, a message from God. And if the sermon is a message from God, my goodness, the implications are massive, both for the preacher and for the listener. If a preacher is delivering God's message, then he quickly realizes that the pulpit is not a comedy stool. I regret that so much of preaching today seems to consist of cavalier, light-hearted joking. Just some coffee shop casualness that clearly doesn't grasp the significance of the moment nor the task. Listen to what Spurgeon said on the seriousness of preaching. Quote, It were better for me that I had never been born than that I preached to these people carelessly or keep back any part of my master's truth. Better to have been a devil than a preacher playing fast and loose with God's word and by such means working the ruin of the souls of men. It would be the height of my ambition to clear, to be clear of the blood of all men. If like George Fox, I can say in dying, I am clear, I am clear. That were almost all of heaven I could wish for. End quote. John Piper comments, quote, lack of intensity in preaching can only communicate that the preacher does not believe or has never been seriously gripped by the reality of which he speaks, end quote. How much preaching today has been gripped by what is popular or by what is political? 
But where can you go to hear one that's gripped by the realities of God? God intends for it to be in every church. And I would add that intensity does not mean it's marked by volume. So much as it's communicated through solemnness and reverence. A preacher's understanding of the task at hand and the weight of what's at stake. It was Jonathan Edwards who described the moment as if heaven and hell are in the balance during the sermon. The intensity of both a Paul Washer and a Sinclair Ferguson are needed. With eternal matters on the line, with a divine message to be conveyed, it is surely a preacher's task to give the people more than jokes, more than stories. It is his task only in the power of the Spirit for a short moment to help them sense the grandeur of God and the realm of heaven that hangs over their mortal fleeting lives. James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. There is no time for flippancy when considering this charge. And if the implications are massive for the preacher, their implication, they're, massive, they're massive for the listener. If God's word being preached is a message from God, then it means it will not always be what you want. That's what the pagans look for. It means that the message of God may sometimes cut it means that the message of God will change your thinking at times. Surely none of us are born with already perfect theology. It means that the message from God will sometimes confront and make me uncomfortable. But what else would we expect? Every Sunday, I aim not just to talk about the Bible nor simply to explain it, but to the best of my ability with pre precision and care, fear and trembling, trying my best to deliver a message from heaven to any who would hear. It's the reality of preaching. Number three, consider the message of preaching. Now, considering what I've said so far, it would be easy for anybody to get up and say, well, I think I have a message from heaven to share. I have a message they need to hear. And so the question becomes, how do we know what a true heavenly message is? That's why we have to consider what the message of preaching is. So I summarize what the message of preaching is like this. Preaching is exposing God's word to God's people meaningfully. Preaching is exposing God's word to God's people meaningfully. At the heart of preaching is a man of God exposing, revealing, bringing to light God's word. This is why Paul was so emphatic with Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 about what to preach. Timothy, preach what? The pop culture, the latest philosophy, critical theories, stories of your childhood, none of those. Timothy, preach the word. Don't be like others who will chase after people's passions in order to hold their attention. Chase after people who are wanting to hear the word. Preach the word. This is why the regular diet of our church is not hearing sermons like this one, but hearing sermons like open your Bibles to John chapter 3 and then 4 and then 5 and then 6 over a year's time where I call you to look at the phrases and the sentences and the grammar, the logic, the arguments. The ones that press your nose into the text of Scripture. Where I ask you, do you see that there? Look at verse 5. Notice verse 2. You see Paul's phrase? Why does he use that language? Why does he ask that question? The best preaching is expositional preaching. Exposing the Word of God. Not a preacher's hobby horse, but the Word of God. It's the regular diet of our church. And if we are exposing God's word, then sermons will come with weight. And the weight may bore the casual church attender. 
But those are the ones who are bored with God already. And the preacher dare not avoid the weight of God and attempt to hold the interest of those bored with God while starving the sheep of God looking to be fed from the word of God. The temptation is real. It's tempting every week to think, what can I say to hold their attention rather than giving them the word? If we are exposing God's word, it will come with weight. But if we're exposing God's word, it will also come with simplicity. To rob a quote from another author, the Bible is deep enough for an elephant to drown in and accessible enough for a two-year-old to swim in. Just as the preacher must not avoid the weight of God, the preacher cannot be too sophisticated to preach the simple truths of God. The Word of God comes to us with simplicity so that we need nothing else in addition to it. I need not say, hey, check out this recent clip from a recent movie. I say, hey, check out this Word from God's Word. It must come with weight. It must come with simplicity. And if we're exposing the Word of God, then preachers should strive for clarity. The old saying goes... If there's a mist in the pulpit, there'll be a fog in the pews. Through weight and simplicity, the preacher must aim to convey the message. This is his task. Will they get the message clearly? Alistair Begg speaks of making the plain things in Scripture the main things. So that the preacher is not talking most about what's popular, but talking most about the gospel, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the work of Jesus, the power of the Spirit, the, the maturity of godliness, the fighting sin for the believer. Exposing the word must come with weight, simplicity, and clarity. And I'll add this. True preaching remembers that it's a message from God for the audience today. So that preaching is not just, hey, let me tell you what it meant for them. No, it's a message to a real live breathing people today. It's why preaching must not remain only an academic educational exercise. And certainly those things are included, but the preacher must remember that he's speaking to real people facing real struggles and temptations, Christians living, trying to perse- persevere in the faith, seniors trying to finish their race well, young people trying to make hard decisions in life, marriages hanging on by threads, parents that are tired and exhausted, and where do they come? They come to sit under the word of God, not to be told only this is what it was 2,000 years ago, but to sit under the word of God and to drink from it about what it means for them now. It's a a message that goes from theory to practice. My grandfather-in-law, who had a tremendous impact on me in preaching, Jay Adams, said it like this, quote, the sermon must leave the platform and move in and out of the lives of the people. I think we're almost done. But I just want to say, if this is a message being exposed to God's people, you might be thinking, you know, I'm not a Christian. I'm not, I don't consider myself part of God's people. And is there a word for me? I want to address just briefly those individuals who might be here today and you might be catching glimpses of this sermon and paying attention, but you would say most of the time, you know, I'm kind of bored with what the person talks about from the Bible. May I tell you that the scriptures teach that the reason that you would find the things of God boring and the reason you would find God boring is because your heart has fallen in love with the created things of God instead of falling in love with the Creator. All people have been in this position committing treason against God, choosing to love his created things more than loving him. You say, how have I committed treason? Well, this is actually the core message of the Christian faith. That God sent his son to reverse what we as humans had messed up. 
that we were created to worship God, to love and adore Him, but we chose to worship and love other things instead. And God says, because you have turned from me, you will experience the punishment of eternal death in your sins. But in love and mercy, God sent His Son, Jesus, who lived a perfectly obedient life, and yet Jesus still died. Why? Not because he deserved death, but because you and I deserve death. You heard it right. Jesus willingly took the place of people who deserve death and said, I'll take that for myself. And then he rose from the grave. He says, you can have my perfect obedience if you would trust me in faith. If you're someone who's been bored with the things of God, you're typically bored by the preaching of God. Could it be that your heart is in love with all the things that God has created instead of loving Him. God would call you to turn away from that idolatry. Turn to look at Jesus who paid for your sins, who was raised to new life to give you eternal, eternal life with Him. It's the message of preaching, exposing God's Word to God's people. There's one more element to consider under what is preaching I'll try to be brief. It's consider the effect of preaching. It's the Bible on preaching, the reality of preaching, the message of preaching. Fourth, consider the effect of preaching. What effect should come from preaching? Early on in my ministry, I had a very seasoned pastor, probably in his late 50s to early 60s, sit me down one day and tell me, Donald, no one preaches like you're trying to anymore. It's dry and boring and too long and irrelevant. And his point was to tell me, you need to tell more stories, you need to cut your sermon in half, and you want to give people more immediate help with what they're facing. But what if the effect of preaching was concerned, first of all, with enlarging one's view of God rather than focusing on one's view of self? What if preaching started first with God's attributes instead of our felt needs? What if one effect of preaching ended up producing individuals who had such a big view of God, a confidence in His sovereignty and providence, so that when the storms of life blew on them, there was already an anchor in place that would hold them? The effect of preaching should enlarge one's view of God so that then alone can one have a proper view of self. You might under, this might help you to understand how I think through preaching. When I come to a text, I don't immediately think, what does this teach me about their problems? My first question is, what does this teach me about God? Because the reality is, I'm going to meet some of you in your tragedy at some point. I'm going to meet you with the hard phone call, the hard meeting at the hospital, the hard wreck on the side of the road. I'm going to meet you there and what will be most comforting to you in that moment is a fresh word from me. It will not be that. No. What will be most comforting for you in that moment is not a fresh word from me but a stabilizing view of God that you already have that's produced over sermon after sermon over sermon that exalts the magnitude of God so that when you're in the moment you hold fast and he holds you. It's the effect of preaching. I'll close with the last question. Why did I preach the sermon? What is preaching? Third question, how should you receive it? How should you receive preaching? I'll be brief. If all that I said is true, and I think the whole of Scripture would demonstrate this, then you should come every Sunday First of all, expecting to hear from God. Why would we ever choose to sleep in when God has a message for us to hear? You guys are very kind and gracious with bearing with me and my limited speaking abilities and the faults that I have. You're gracious to chew up whatever meat that I give and spit out the bones. 
whoever is preaching, if he's truly preaching, regardless of style or flair, regardless of your preference or not, if he's truly preaching, he's giving a message from God and you should expect to hear it every week. Expect to hear from God. Number two, you should come every Sunday examining the preacher's accuracy. Do not receive my words as from God unless I can show you in the scriptures. You should come with open Bibles following along in the verses. The way that I typically preach is really helpful for you, especially if you're looking for the end of the sermon. <laughs> because if I'm preaching five verses, when I get to verse five, you know it's almost over. <laughs> but examine carefully. And while you examine carefully, don't look for insignificant hills to die on. I promise you, your encouragement is more helpful than your discouragement. <laughs> We're going to disagree over minor things. That's fine. But examine carefully nonetheless because I don't have the power. It's in the text. Finally this. Expect to hear from God. Examine the preacher's accuracy. Finally, every Sunday, eagerly come ready to submit to God's word. If it's his message that's proclaimed for you today, then you should be eager to, ex eager to respond and submit to what he would call you to. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the centuries of church history that show the fruit of faithful preaching. What a kindness you have given to the church today to persevere in this task by looking back on the fruit of this exercise. I pray that you would elevate in all our minds the significance of what's taking place in pre- I pray, Lord, that any elevation that takes place would not be because of something that Donald says or Mark or Will or Josh or Richard or Ethan or Scotty or Steve or whoever may be preaching, but Lord, I pray that elevations would take place because of what's seen in your word. So keep us faithful in preaching. Make us ready for your appearing in your kingdom. And keep us preaching the word, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.